I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind cause it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. It's a couple of days before I'm headed out on our trip. We're going to see the eclipse. We're going to head to over to Indiana, try our luck there, although our luck's not looking all that great. But I'm still looking forward to the trip for reasons that I'm going to describe in this video here. The reason I wanted to do a video is that what we got going on over here, it feels an awful lot like bugging out. In fact, all these bags here, these are my my bug out bags. These are It's kind of a modular system that I've got set up here. Uh, I've got one of them already ripped into. This is a bug out bag that carries all sorts of bedding stuff and the bedding is all kind of getting put into the back of the car over here. I've got an EDC pack that pretty much functions as what most people would consider to be a bug out bag but for really bugging out you want to have an awful lot more than you can fit in a backpack if possible so I've got all these other uh, bags that are kind of like I said a modular system. This bag here is full of uh, various camping uh, equipment you know water bladders, uh, fire starters, uh, water filters, all, all, all sorts of things you might want to use when you're camping. This bag here is full of shelter. We've got a tent in there and some tarps. Uh, we've got a bunch of extra tarps over in this bag. Uh, these sleeping bags kind of shove into the bedding bag here. This bag right here is a food bag. And we've got some other things going on uh, in here already. One thing that I would want to take if I needed a bug out is this right here. This is a rocket stove. Uh, it's not super easy to carry around if you're just going to do backwoods camping. I wouldn't recommend it for that, but for uh, going anywhere in a car, works really, really well. It's very efficient on fuel use. And uh, this is a car that we use uh, on a daily basis, and I guess it would be what we would use if we ever needed a bug out. It's a Toyota Prius. It gets really, really good fuel economy. If we were to take the gas tank of what's in here, plus, uh, you know, I've got a uh, down uh, over in this this tent over here, we've got, uh, I think, 20, 25 gallons worth of uh, gasoline stored up over there. Even if we just took a couple of those, took another 10 gallons uh, and put it in the back over here, uh, we could get a thousand miles on a fill up uh, with this car. So you can get a pretty good distance uh, using this vehicle. Some people will say, oh, a Toyota Prius is stupid because uh, you know, you can't really go off road with it. But, uh, you know, I've mentioned this in other videos in the past. Here, this is where I live, this is New England, and uh, here's our driveway uh, right here. And let's say, you know, we're driving down our driveway, and um, let's say I've, I've got something that's not a Toyota Prius. Let's say I've got, you know, some kind of a beefy, uh, you know, all wheel drive truck or something like that. And let's say there's some kind of a big roadblock up there and we just can't go on the road. So it's time to go off road here in New England. So let's go off road here uh, using our, our off road vehicle. And we're gonna go off. First thing we got here is a three foot pit going over some, some rocks over the edge there. Goes down to this little valley area here. Uh, you know, maybe you can, you can crash down into this. And then all we've got is some giant diameter logs across the, the ground here. But let's say, you know, th these were cleared for building our house. You know, you're not gonna have necessarily giant fallen trees everywhere in uh, New England if you wanna go off-road. So maybe you'd be able to go off-road uh, over here. This is more natural forest right here. So, uh, you know, we still got some debris. I'm not gonna walk across there. Okay, well, here, here's a good example. This is just kind of normal New England forest we got. So, again, we can't, uh, can't drive on our, our road here because it's some kind of a, a roadblock. We gotta go off-road. Again, going off-road here in New England. So let's turn off over here. Looks like this is kind of an area to turn off right near our well. Kind of head up in this direction. And uh, got a lot of rocks and a lot of trees here. Let's see, uh, can we kind of navigate our, our truck through these trees? I'm just gonna put the camera down here and you guys can give me a, a sense of uh, what you think my chances would be if I wanted to drive a truck maybe up through this area. Perhaps they could kind of fit it around here and uh, we can't go that way because of this tree. And over there is a big boulder. Over there is just trees, trees, trees. I don't think we can get more than a few feet off road here. And uh, 
Yeah, that, that, that's kind of that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is you know, depending on where you are, it, the the idea of having or needing an off-road vehicle because you know when you bug out, you're going to go off the roads. There are a lot of places in the country where you just, you're not going off-road <laughs> unless you're going to you know get a chainsaw and like you know you want to go through go off-road in this area over here. I guess you can kind of get through here. We got you know it's kind of a pit here, but you can kind of worm your way around that. You can maybe get about 15 feet in here before you're just completely surrounded by trees and rocks. You know, maybe you can kind of maybe you kind of go down through that way. Again, you're going to be fighting for inches going through here. So you can bring a chainsaw with you in your off-road vehicle all you like. But uh, you know, in a lot of areas in the country, it, it doesn't matter whether or not you uh, you got an off-road vehicle or not because you know a lot of these places you just can't go off-road. Now, uh, other places in the country. It might make total sense, you know, if you have like wide open area, like, you know, fields, prairie land, that kind of stuff. You can drive over that kind of stuff. But a lot of areas of the country where it's just really forested, really uh, hilly, rocky, boulders everywhere, you know, you may as well have a, a car that has really good fuel economy because uh, you ain't going to really be doing any uh, off-roading uh, anyway. So let's head back up to my super fuel efficient, but uh, not really good off-road bug out vehicle. I wanted to kind of show you what we got going on over here. I mentioned that I'm still looking forward to this trip. Uh, it's not because I'm under the impression that the, the weather's going to be really good. In fact, the uh, forecast for the entire country is looking uh, pretty uh, pretty pessimistic, uh, pessimistic for this uh, eclipse, which is unfortunate, but for April, not at all unexpected. I, I remember it was, uh, you know, a couple years ago, I was talking about how we were going to do this. Eclipse trip, we had a great time uh, checking out the last eclipse. We went down to Tennessee near Pigeon Forge. Uh, there was a Titanic museum right there, and we did Titanic museum, and there were some caves. There was some, this cool cave complex where there were actually an underground lake. There were boats across the lake, so we went down there. We did that, and uh, from the parking lot of this cave complex, uh, you know, we, we get to appreciate the eclipse. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful day that day. And, uh, you know, I was looking forward to, to this eclipse ever since, but I was really sober about the fact that this eclipse is happening in April. April showers bring May, uh, May flowers is the, the old saying, and April showers usually come from clouds, and clouds are exactly what we, uh, we look like we're going to be having a lot of uh, for this eclipse. But I am not, uh, not all uh, dissuaded from doing the trip uh, for or the reason that you know, well, it's the same kind of thing that uh, applies to all sorts of different preps. Whenever you get a prep, try to make your preps be things that ha have utility outside of that kind of emergency situation. Like, for example, um, I think for an example, uh, well, something that you would use to be, uh, you know, collecting firewood in an emergency, you know, like a chainsaw or something like that. If you can have it be something that you can utilize during your every uh, everyday, normal, day-to-day -day life, uh, you don't have to wait for an emergency for that chainsaw to pay off so that you can use it for collecting firewood for your emergency purposes if you create a lifestyle where you can uh, you know, benefit from that chainsaw independent of whether that or not that's an emergency. Same thing with solar power. We have solar power on the house. That's great when we have blackouts, uh, you know, uh, if there's an ice storm or whatnot. Uh, the uh, solar panels on the roof make it so that we you know, have power for it to meet our needs. But also during everyday life, uh, we don't have to pay for all, uh, a bunch of extra electricity. So our, electric, uh, our electricity bills are really, really low because there's a very small number of days where we have to go off of our panels and jump onto the grid. Today, for example, you can see it's certainly not very sunny, but the, with the panels on the roof, it's giving us just enough to kind of meet our basic uh, utility needs. As to whether or not it's going to be enough to uh, keep up with our hot water heater, which kicks on in about 10 minutes. It goes on from uh, solar 10 o'clock to solar 2 o'clock. Uh, you know, it'll be riding that line there. Uh, but again, solar power is something that even if an emergency doesn't happen, you can still benefit from it. And that's what we're doing with this trip. That's what I did with the last trip for the last solar eclipse. I, I mentioned we went down to see the solar eclipse, but we were also going um, to this place called Pigeon Forge, which has a, a Titanic museum. My boy was really into uh, uh, history around the Titanic. So we went there. Uh, so even if the eclipse was a bust, 
we'd have that memory, so the, the trip wouldn't be a waste. We also went to these caves, which was uh, another opportunity to make the trip not be a waste. And that's what we're doing on this trip. So we're going to Indiana, uh, to a friend of mine's place. We're gonna try to appreciate it together. Uh, we're gonna be doing a video together because he's a fe fellow YouTuber and I'm not gonna tip, uh, tip my hat to who it is yet. Maybe I'll mention that later on. Uh, so, you know, we're going to get to meet each other in person. We've known each other for a while online. We're going to get to do a video together. Uh, we're going to see some of the local sites in the area. Uh, on the way back, uh, for myself, I essentially have to drive right by Ni uh, Niagara Falls uh, from New England, headed over to uh, Indiana to get over there. So on the way back, we're going to be stopping over at Niagara Falls. So that is going to be a positive, uh, you know, whether or not we're able to see the eclipse. So just like it's important for your everyday uh, preps to have utility outside of whether there's an emergency. If you're planning a trip, and I know this is kind of late to be giving you guys this advice now, maybe like I should have mentioned it, you know, two years ago when I was first kind of planning all these things out, uh, although this, this doesn't really fall under emergency preparedness, but you know, it, it really uh, uh, folds into that whole uh, kind of mindset of uh, creating situations, uh, you know, acquiring tools that have benefit outside of X, Y, or Z. So if X, Y, or Z doesn't happen, if we don't have a clear day, it's still going to be a useful trip. So uh, for the rest of this video, I was just going to kind of start packing things up. I've been pulling uh, out a lot of my bedding stuff out of here. I think what we're going to be trying to do is to just sleep in the car instead of using our tent. Because uh, driving out there, we, we've got one just uh, nighttime stay over, uh, uh, over in New York State, Western New York State, where we're just going to be sleeping overnight. And then we're going to continue the rest of our journey over to Indiana. And I don't want to pull out the whole tent just for an overnight kind of thing especially because it's going to be kind of chilly so it wouldn't just be the tent it'd be the tent plus some extra tarps and all that so uh, i think we're going to be just operating out of the car i've only slept in a car once before uh and i recall it being really humid in the morning when i woke up <laughs> and um, because i was parked not exactly in a flat area i remember it wasn't the best night's sleep so we're i'm going to be uh trying to learn from those uh lessons of my past and you know, ad adapting. I've got some mattresses in here. These are, I'm gonna get a closer shot over here. Uh, these are some mattresses that I always uh, use camping. I think these are really great. Uh, these are made by Thermarest, if you can read upside down. I've got uh, two of them stacked up, uh, cause, uh, cause I'm old. <laughs> I used to rock with one, now I like two. Uh, my boy uh, just uses the one uh, Thermarest mattress uh, right over here. Uh, I think these are really great. There's lots of non uh, Thermarest brand mattresses uh, that are out there. Uh, but every single one that I've ever gotten that has not been a Thermarest mattress has always developed a, a hole in it. And that's not to say that every brand that isn't Thermarest uh, is always going to develop a hole. But I just know in my personal experience, whenever I've tried something that wasn't Thermarest, it ended up developing a hole later on. In particular, there were some ones I got, uh, you know, I'm not going to say where I got them from because I don't remember exactly. But they were big, they were posh, they were three inches thick with an air bladder and a bunch of foam in there. And they were super comfortable until they started leaking and then, you know, they would just deflate every night. And now I'm not really sure what to do with these things. I guess they're just uh, landfill fodder, um, which is a shame. I, th that's the other downside of, of having cra you know, purchasing crappy uh, materials. Not only do you end up wasting your money because you have to buy them multiple times and you end up, you know, spending more money over time, but also all, all this crap just ends up, you know, being thrown into landfill. So there's so many reasons just buy good quality stuff. You get it once, it doesn't end up in a landfill. You save money in the long run, and uh, you know you don't get disappointed uh, going out camping and then finding out that uh, you're uh, you're sleeping. Uh, you're essentially sleeping on the on the rocks underneath your tent in the morning. Um, so uh, we're we're trying for this, and uh, I've laid in a little. Uh, there's a packing blanket back here. I actually keep that in my car all the time. I always keep all the back seats down. I, I sit, it's a five-seater car, but I use it as a two-seater car with uh, this, you know, open area in the back. So I've always got this down to kind of protect the inside of the car a little bit. I mean, I use it as a utility vehicle, but, you know, if you can keep it from getting too torn up, I like to do that. So we, I always have the blanket in the back, and uh, then I put down, this is a, just a camping pad that goes inside of uh, my tent. I like always having that inside the tent because, you know, when you get into your tent, there's oftentimes a little bit of grit that gets in there, and if it's, it's you and the grit right up against the bottom of the tent, I feel like you're going to scuff up and rip up the tent, so I always have a little bit of a cloth down there to catch things. also makes it easier to dump out, so I threw that in there. I got the uh, double layers for me and single layer for my boy. I've uh, got some sheets, and the sheets are always kept 
in the bedding bag. The bedding bag's got the, the mattresses, uh, it's got uh, sleeping bags in there. I've got some sheets in the bedding bag. I also have some things like towels, uh, you know, for uh, your bathing in there. And I also keep uh, something that is, uh, I think it's kind of kind of an important thing. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily think about it until you're partway through your trip. I always keep a, uh, a laundry bag in there. Uh, this is just a you know, cloth bag. And, uh, you know, as you're going through your, your clothes, you can start throwing them in here. And, uh, you know, you have a place to kind of segregate out all your dirty laundry. And that's kind of important when you're partway through the trip, so you don't, you're not getting confused between what's the clean stuff and what's the dirty stuff. You don't have to go, like, smelling everything, and it's not, like, all scattered around your, uh, your living space. So uh, this bag is pretty much empty at this point. We're going to be using the roof pod up top to store that. And uh, this is going to be a challenging trip because uh, we're going to be trying to live in a variety of different sorts of situations. Uh, driving out there, I mentioned that we're uh, going to stop just overnight. Uh, after driving about five hours, we'll be stopping and uh, just sleeping in the back of the car. And then we've got our, our long day of driving <clears throat> to get all the way to Indiana the next day. Um, so that night, we're just going to be sleeping in the car. But then once we get to Indiana, uh, the situation there is a little bit, uh, a little bit challenging. Also, uh, we're at my friend's place. He's got some retreat land. And he's got kind of a shack there, but the shack's sort of for him and his family. And we're going to be in our tent or our car. Um, so that that that's all fine. Uh, you know, you know, no curveballs there. Uh, apparently, though, there's an awful lot of ticks there this time of year. And here in New England, we're, we're used to dealing with ticks all the time. In fact, last uh, well, yesterday, uh, I was out with my boy. I was teaching a class uh, to some. Uh, some kids and we were out in the woods and uh, I know at least my boy came back and he had a tick right on his arm uh, here it came out really easily uh, you know no, no no big thing uh, you know so we're you know we're not um we're not strangers to ticks around here we got plenty of them in fact down by the stream down here I remember a couple of years ago we were hanging out there a lot and between the spring and June I counted 800 ticks that we captured and, and killed uh, down by the stream and I stopped counting at 800 and then you had all the rest of the summer. So we probably went like well over a thousand, pro probably, you know, close to 2,000 ticks. So, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're, again, we're not strangers to ticks, uh, so I'm not like, oh, ticks, I can't, I just can't totally deal with that. But, you know, when you're in a tent on the ground and like if the ticks are climbing up, I'm just picturing like waking up some morning and like, you ever you know, go tenting and you've got your tent and then there's a rain fly and flies always kind of seem to find their way up under the rain fly and there's spiders. You know, you wake up in the morning and you're looking up at like your mesh and you see little you know uh, spiders crawling around and, and flies kind of tapping on the top. I'm just picturing seeing like tons of ticks up there. You know what ticks look like when they're up on the edge of the grass where they just get their arms out like that <laughs> waiting to grab you. I'm just gonna I'm just picturing like uh, you know our tent covered in ticks with all their arms reached out and then I'm wondering like. How am I going to pack that tent up at the end? <laughs> I'll have to pick all the ticks off, uh, you know, before I put in the car. Otherwise, our car will just be full of ticks. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a challenging environment there. Uh, in addition to the fact that uh, they, he doesn't have any kind of, there's no restrooms or, or um, outhouse or anything like that set up, which is no big deal. You just go out into the woods and do that. But I wanted to get permission for him. Like, is, is it cool that we can just kind of go in the woods and bury it? Like, you know, you don't want to be, uh, you know, shitting on somebody else's backyard, <laughs> so to speak, you know, uh, literally in this case. Um, so we want to get permission there. And also, uh, we need to bring our own water because you don't have water on site. Uh, and usually when I go camping, we'll either be near a stream where it's easy enough to pump it, and, or it is, um, you know, the, there's running water at a campground if you're at a campground. Uh, so bringing a bunch of water isn't uh, something that I'm accustomed to doing, but that's something that we're going to be having to bring. And I've got five-gallon jugs of water that we're going to be loading up in here as well. And then on the way back, we are going to be at an actual campground when we go to Niagara Falls. We've got a couple of nights at a campground there. So that'll be, that'll be really posh. In fact, these campgrounds, it's a KOA campground, and they even have these things. I've never seen this before, a camping kiosk, which apparently has, like, power running right to a tent site. So I, I get that's glamping if I ever heard it. you have actual you know AC power at the uh, at the tent site. Uh, so um, there's just a variety of situations. If we were just going to that last campground, there's a bunch of things that I wouldn't need to bring. If we just go into my friend's house, there's a bunch of things here that I wouldn't need to bring. If we we're just going to the initial place where we're camping out of the car, there's a bunch of things that I wouldn't need to bring. But because we're uh, going to be existing in all these different kind of situations, you know, we're kind of trying to bring an awful lot of stuff. And an added layer of complexity is that we have a snowstorm coming in um, to the rest, like late today, 
through tomorrow uh, into the following day. And the following day is when we're going to be leaving. So that's why I'm packing the car up right now is because we're supposed to be getting rain and sleet and snow. And there's going to be at least a couple inches of snow on the ground when we're leaving. And you saw how it's nice to have all your stuff spread out and dry uh, while we're packing up. So that's why I am uh, I'm doing this today. So I'm getting the, the sheet in here. And the rest of the video is just going to be me kind of jibber jabbering about what I'm doing and uh, if you want to hang out for it you're welcome to and if not that was the meat of it I just wanted to share the idea of uh, you know the modular uh, system here and the idea of you know if you're gonna go on a trip like this and it's unsure about you know whether or not you're gonna get to see you know the eclipse or some other kind of event or if you're unsure about whether there's an emergency or a disaster ever gonna happen in your life if you can make your preparations such that you can have a good time that you can uh, get utility out of your preps whether that X Y or Z event happens or not whether that eclipse is visible or not you can still have a good time on your trip those are ways of trying to ensure that no matter what you may not get the experience that maybe was your your top pick but you'll least get something positive out of it that's it thanks for watching and continue watching if you want to see me load up the rest of this i'm sure there's going to be some weird stuff coming up because uh, i haven't really thought this through very much uh, that's why i have all these modular bags so i can just kind of like throw it together and kind of figure it out as i go uh one thing i, I realized while i was uh rolling this is that uh those water jugs uh where am i going to put those water jugs they could go behind the seats here maybe they're big, the big five gallon ones. They're from my fallout shelter. In fact, maybe we should uh, we could head over there now and grab one. Why don't we head over there now and grab a, grab a water jug? Because uh, I'm not sure how much water we're gonna need and uh, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna run out of water. So the reason this chicken is here all by himself is that he's our one of our two roosters and he finally started fighting with the other rooster and uh, you know, we're just trying to keep him safe over there. He, they, he's a pet, you know, he's a little pet and uh, we're not, I'm not gonna chop his head off. And the big rooster I, I wanna keep cause he's like our functional rooster and uh, I don't wanna chop his head off. He's up in there with all the hens right now. But uh, I don't know, it's hard when you have pets and they try to kill each other. All right, so here we are at the fallout shelter where I keep all of my five gallon water jugs. I'll set you guys down here. Keep this locked up, just because there's a lot of stuff in here. You know, we got all our Geiger counters and everything in here. All right, so go in. It. I'll leave you guys out here. You can time me. How long it? How long does it take me to go in and get a empty jug? That's what I'm talking about. Not too, not too long. So this one's empty. We've got full ones in there, but they've got um, chlorinated water. Although maybe I want to. Nah, no, nah, I'm not gonna mess with that. I was thinking I could, I can swap out, swap out the chlorinated water. You should cycle through that. But uh, I don't think I'm gonna mess with that. All right. So keys in the pocket. I need to use this prop on the door because the bottom sticks out a little, so like mice and spiders could crawl up in there. So I do this to keep the bottom closed. All right, so we'll bring this back. I'll fill this up at a later time, but I want to make sure that it actually fits uh, while I'm packing the car. My goal at the end of the day today is to have everything packed in and then the snowstorm can come in and then all we got to do is just kind of carry a, a bag with clothes out to the car and we're good to go. Yeah, a lot about this trip I'm a little bit apprehensive about. Not to mention all the things I, I'm sure if you guys are watching prepping videos you know there's all sorts of uh warnings about you know what's going to happen on april 8th and uh, you know a lot of them are coming from official sources you know, like various states are saying people should uh, stock up and get ready for emergencies and have a week of food and uh people <laughs> people are talking about cern firing up their uh react not that you know these are these are just things that i i hear not necessarily things that i'm at all concerned about uh I think the only real concern that I have with the, uh, the eclipse is, uh, you guys could be a little closer than that. I think the only concern I have about the eclipse is just the idea that there's just gonna be so many people out for it. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, well, this is my thought on it anyway. I wanna get an actual good shot of my car while I'm packing here. Right. Um, I know a lot of people were thinking, well, it's kind of stupid that uh, governments are suggesting there's gonna be a lot of um, people 
showing up to the eclipse because you know a lot of people see the world through the lens of their own thoughts and wants and desires and people will say well I don't care about an eclipse so I can't imagine a bunch of other people going out for an eclipse so you know the government must be lying when they're they're saying that their concern is there's going to be a lot of people going out to this eclipse because that's crazy because I would never do it so that means nobody else would ever want to do it um not a great way to uh, evaluate the world by seeing it all through you know only your own uh, your own eyes so different people have different experiences and I I would suspect that one of the reasons why a lot of people might want to go out and see this eclipse is because when the last one came through the country uh, you know I had the good fortune of well not, it wasn't good fortune I, I had the foresight and planning to go out and not miss it myself uh, so I got to appreciate it and people like myself uh, who experienced that and thought it was amazing uh, it was so much cooler than I thought it was going to be. I went out thinking it was going to be pretty cool. I'd never seen a total solar eclipse before. And uh, it was so much cooler than I thought it was going to be. Uh, the difference between when it's like 90 or 95% and 100% is literally and figuratively night and day. Like as it was getting dimmer and dimmer going up towards 100%, you know, all the way up to like almost, you know, 98%, it was kind of like, oh, okay, well, it's dim, but, you know, it's not, and, you know, you can see it through the glass, you see it's a crescent, but it wasn't like your whole landscape changed. As soon as it went to 100%, it was, it was really, really amazing. Uh, the way I've described it uh, is like, people would say, well, I've seen eclipses on video, I'll just watch it on YouTube. That's kind of, that's the difference between, um, uh, you know, watching a movie and seeing two characters like making out in the movie versus actually making out with someone yourself. It's, it's, you know, there, it's not the same experience that you can you experience vicariously through a video. It's a totally different thing if you're really there. And uh, you know, I can't describe it any more than that because that's what I'm saying is it, you have to experience it. There's some things in life that you have to experience. You know, it, life isn't all about just looking at different people's social media posts and uh, commenting on them and criticizing them and all, all that kind of stuff. Life is about getting out there and experiencing life. You only got one shot at it. And, you know, it's important to get out there and, uh, you know, live your life. And experiences are meant to be experienced. You know, it's great to share them and it's great to share in other people's experiences. But experiences are best when they are experienced. So if you ever have a chance uh, to get out and see an eclipse, maybe it's not too late for you to try to see this one, although the weather doesn't look too great for this, uh, in 2040, in 20 years from now, here in the United States, there's supposed to be another one. Uh, eclipses happen all over the world all the time, if you're willing to travel. I'd highly recommend trying to check one out, at least at some point in your life, though, because it is amazing. So anyway, people like me, who saw the last eclipse, came back from it and were blabbing like what I just did there to like anyone who would listen to me and a few people who didn't want to listen to me. And, uh, you know, we spread this sense of like um, people having missed out on that last one. And I think a lot of people who experience feeling like they missed out on that last one aren't going to want to let this one pass them by. And I think that's why there is anticipation that there is going to be a lot more travel. In addition to that, it's pretty easy to just look at hotel bookings and, uh, you know, campground ground uh, reservations and uh, you, know, you can tell you know how many people have already started booking up that area I know it you know is uh, recently as like a, almost a year ago I started like poking around at different campgrounds like Niagara Falls the um, uh, eclipse goes right over Niagara Falls and I was thinking well that'd be a pretty cool place to do it so about a year ago I started poking around at different ca campgrounds everything was already booked up a year in advance so the anticipation for this event I think is um, you know, it's real. It's there, and a lot of people didn't want to miss out on this one. So that's why I think why a lot of people are traveling, and that is the only thing that I have any real concerns about, is just, you know, whenever there's a lot of people, there's accidents, uh, you, know, and the, you know, shortages and things, and that's why, you know, I'm not relying on going to grocery stores. Push comes to shove, we've got our food bag. This is all, like, just basic food. We're going to bring some other food as well, but, uh, you know, that is just... You know, we could go for a couple of weeks off of uh, what, what is in that bag and we'd be, we'd be okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm not fearing for my life and I'm not worried about, uh, you know, NASA. They're doing some test rockets up into the ionosphere, I think. I'm not sure which la level of the atmosphere, but they're shooting them up underneath. Uh, they're not hitting the moon with their rockets. They're not shooting them into the sun. They're shooting them up uh, into the sky, I guess, to do sensing of what happens electromagnetically or something in the uh, the upper layers of the atmosphere. Uh, I'm not sure what the utility of that information is other than just it's, you know, it's interesting and good for people to learn more about our world because uh, the more that we know is, you know, actual and real, the you know, more we can kind of leverage that if we want to, you know, do something or accomplish something. So, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm not concerned about any of that. You know, as far as CERN, I don't really know much, that much about what CERN's doing, but I know every time uh, someone fires up another um, particle uh, collider, uh, people are always talking about it opening up wormholes through space and time and destroying the whole Earth, and we've fired up an awful lot of these uh, super uh, colliders, and, you know, the world's still here. So I'm not, not really concerned about any of that. It's just the crowds that ha has me kind of thinking. So, so that's where I am on that. I gotta figure out a place to put this. Now, I, I could put it on its side up in the in the pod up here, but I think that'd be maybe uh, that might be a disaster waiting to happen because this thing could leak. So I think this thing needs to be vertical. I think I could be behind the seat here. I can I can drop it in there, or we can travel with this thing just out here maybe, and then. Uh, you know, we take it out of the car when we're when we're parked. I'm not really sure about this one. I am not sure about. You know what I might do with this? I could strap it to something. So I, I could I could put it in here, and I could get some uh, you know these tie down straps, and I could kind of tether it like a seatbelt, and just make sure that it uh, it isn't gonna fall over. That this one's gonna require some thought though. I gotta figure that one out. This is easy. If we're not going to need it for sleeping in the car, it goes up in the roof pod. And we're probably not going to use this for the whole trip. This is, this is literally a prep for emergencies. Alright, so that goes up there. What else we got? We've got sleeping bags. That's pretty obvious. They're going to go uh, here where we sleep. Uh, I guess I'll just pull them, pull them to this end. i got to close off these valves at some point. I think I'll, I'll do that later, though. Uh, whenever you open these things up again, uh, the Thermarest mattresses, after they've been compressed for a while, the foam inside is all crushed down. In fact, technically, you're supposed to leave them uncompressed, but it just, it's just—it's un—it's uh, unrealistic, really, to do it that way because uh, they just take up so much room. So I, I leave them compressed. Worst comes to worst, you can blow into them, but that's not the best thing to do because you put humidity in. When you do that, okay, got more uh, sleeping bags. This one is a. This is a Lightning McQueen, like uh, Disney's cars sleeping bag, and I got it for my boy because he liked race cars when he was little. But uh, it's been a lot of years; he's been too old for that one, so I use the Lightning McQueen bag. Got another one here. I'm just I'm always picking up sleeping bags from like free sources. This is the last one that I got free. You always, you know, people aspirationally get this stuff and then realize, ah, I'm just never using that, and they give it away. And I'm always getting free sleeping bags. That was the last one I've got. I think I got that at some transfer station, uh, like a recycle place. Uh, you know, these people get rid of their trash, get rid of the recyclables, and some places will have this kind of a swap area where like perfectly good things just don't use anymore. They'll put them in there. I, th I think that's where I got that. Uh, I got one more sleeping bag. This is a small one, but this is a pretty high-tech one, uh, which does pretty well. Uh, this is actually the first sleeping bag I ever bought years ago. Okay, so that's a lot of bedding in there. We're going to have to add uh, pillows to this. I've got a list inside of things as well. What else we got? I'm going to bring some of these bags over here. All right. Okay, so here's one that's not going to go inside. This is the, what I call the shelter bag. It's got the tent, rain fly, stakes, all the um, poles for the tent. And I think there might be a tarp or two in here as well. I'm not going to be needing this at all inside the car for our first night sleeping, so up in the pod with this. The nice thing about having all these uh, modular bags is I know I'm chit-chatting a lot about uh, you know, what, why I'm putting in what and what it's for and where I'm going to put it, but if there was ever an emergency situation, whew, everything just gets thrown in and and we're gone, and you know we can sort through it at la through it later. I'm just trying to make it nice and neat because uh, when we get to our first location, it might be raining at that point, and we just we don't want to have to mess with moving things around, getting them all wet and stuff. These are tarps. Don't need tarps except for uh, we're setting up the tent, so that goes up here too. I love having the pod on the top. It's a really nice uh, addition uh, to this vehicle. Uh, this bag here is empty, so this just goes up top, close up the side. Now, oh, 
close that up. Okay. So this just goes up top. Smells like camping. All right, what else we got? All right, here's a camping bag. I'll go through a few things in here. And I tried to, I tried to reference a few things while uh, I was talking about it earlier, but they weren't jumping to mind. Oh yeah, here we go. We've got uh, solar panels in here. I don't have a lot of these kind of fold up solar panels, but I, I do have two of them. I keep them in here. These are, uh, can charge uh, AA batteries in this little charger here. And you can use it for different things. You also uh, can charge uh, USB devices directly. I've got two of these. Goal Zero is kind of, kind of an RA company. It's not the cheapest stuff you can buy, but it seems to last pretty well, except for one flashlight that I bought from them. You know those kind of kitchen uh, utensils will do this, flashlights will do this, bin binoculars will do this. They have that kind of rubberized surface that after a couple of years starts getting sticky. Uh, if you know, let me know down in the comments below anything you can use to get that stickiness off. I've tried a bunch of different solvents to try to just dissolve it away, but I, I got a flashlight from them once and it had that on it. And now it's just this tacky, disgusting mess all over the surface. And um, that's the one thing I got from them that was kind of junky, uh, just because of that. I don't know why people still use that stuff because they know the, the, the chemical profile on that plastic or rubber or whatever it is. People know it's chemical profile. They know that that's going to happen. That's a choice on the part of the company to do that. And it totally puts a, a um, expiration date on their product. This is kind of neat. This is, I'll take it out just a little bit. This is a uh, solar oven. And uh, I've used this on a number of occasions when I've been out camping, like in a place where we have sun. It's just a fold out solar oven. Like, uh, yeah, like that. I'm not going to put it all together, but it kind of opens up like that. You point it out at the sun, and uh, it uh, works pretty well. If I can just get it back, uh, back together. How does that fold up? Obviously, I don't use it like on a daily basis. Is that not supposed to be together? Is that it? Is that... I'm having the worst trouble trying to... There we go, okay, cool. Got a little uh, tray with it and a, a thermostat as well. You know, if I knew it was gonna be that crazy, I wouldn't have taken it out. <laughs> it, it is kinda cool too, it's got a little silicone pot that pops out that you can use. I've never used that though, I just use a metal pot. Or mostly it's just used to reheat things. Okay, I can't, I can't handle, one hand all that stuff in there. It was, I, I, I warned you guys, it was travel at your own risk if you were wanting to watch the rest of this video. Not high production value. I just got to get this car packed before the rain comes in, is all. So maybe I got to move a little faster myself. I'll show you one more thing in here. And I, actually, this is going to come up. Oh, two more things. This is kind of a really neat knife. I don't get to use it very much because I keep it in my uh, camping gear, but it's a SOG knife. Really nice feel to that, that thing. I like that knife. But it's in my camping stuff all the time, so I don't get to use it a lot. Here's the other thing I want to show you guys. Uh, camp shower. You're definitely going to be using that. You're going to not be smelling that great after a couple of days. So uh, that'll be helpful. Okay, so let's get this stuff back in there. I got other things in here. There's hot, uh, hot water bladders for uh, keeping yourself warm. I think there's a fishing pole in here. Little one. Collapsible. All sorts of stuff. Got some survival books in here, which are actually kind of... Uh, not that great. I'm, I'm actually making a homesteading and emergency survival book myself because a lot of the books that are out there I don't really like. They, um, there we go. Uh, a lot of the books out there I, I, I don't care for because they, they spend a lot of pages talking about like the basic stuff that like if you've ever done it before, you don't really need a reminder on it. But for, you know, certain types of things that, you know, someone that you know, goes out and engages in this type of stuff regularly, might need a reminder on, like, let's say you wanted to remember Morse code or something. Like, that's not something you use all the time, but for some reason, let's say that it comes up. It'd be nice to have a book that just kind of has, has, it's got that in there. And, you know, other things, like maybe knots. If you, you, know, you have trouble remembering your knots, like a couple notes on knots, or, uh, you know, all the types of things that, like, your average prepper that already knows how to, like, build a fire. You don't need, like, five pages with beautiful color pictures about how to build a fire uh, but like all, all the kind of stuff that like tends to kind of fall out of your head that's why I'm making a I'm making that book it's kind of like like a like a cheat sheet for preppers like all, all the stuff that's hard to keep in your mind 
Um, I find that the, I've never found a survival book that has that kind of stuff, and I'd love that, just to have a really small book that just has all that kind of stuff you tend to forget. So I'm making it at this point. All right, this goes up here, because we're not going to be using that first night. All right, what else we got? All right, well, we, we got the, uh, we got that, and I'll just leave that here for now. And we've got cook pots and uh, some more cooking stuff here. And that's all the basic stuff. That what you saw me put in, that's all the stuff I bring camping all the time. You get packs like that, and you're camping with like five or ten minutes notice. That's my always my goal. And the, the great thing about that is not only is all this stuff like bug out um, uh, supplies, but also it is, uh, you know, it, whenever you go camping, and I, I was finding this myself, I never used to have any of this stuff when I was going, going camping. Like, if I was going to go camping, I would think about all the things I need camping, and I kind of separately pack them. I need a backpack, or I should, need, I should bring a knife with me, I should bring something, you know, for cooking with me. You know, you have a lot of camping stuff, but then there's other things like sheets and towels and things like that. It's not like, that's not ex exclusively a camping item. And it dawned on me at one point, you know, why am I unpacking all of my camping bags only to, you know, in a couple of months or next year when I go camping again, only to repack all the exact same stuff over again. So ever since then, I just kept them permanently packed. I had, you know, lists and uh, I would take notes. If I depleted anything out of a pack, I'd, I'd resupply it. But, um, you know, if you go camping on any kind of a regular basis, it just makes sense to keep all the packs you know, ready to go so you don't have to, you know, reinvent the wheel every single time that you go out. And that said, you know, oftentimes you'll add more things to the packs as you go or you'll subtract things that you find like you're never using. But, uh, you know, both for that benefit and also for just having a ready-to-go bug-out situation, um, I like the idea of keeping my camping bags packed all the time. I think I'll put this right on top of that uh, rocket stove here. That'll also make it so that the... Um, the bedding and stuff isn't falling onto the, the sooty top of it. Here's another thing that I'm bringing for this trip is a road atlas. I actually borrowed this one. I was I tried to buy a road atlas. I've got some uh, some nationwide maps, uh, you know, already. Uh, you know, as you might imagine, given that I'm you know a prepper. <laughs> But I've got them in the fallout shelter, and the reason I had them in there is because if you ever went into the fallout shelter for like a radiological uh, emergency, we have communications equipment going in there, radios, and if you were finding out uh, that there were, you know, radiation events happening in some area of the country, if they just said some city that you weren't familiar with, it'd be nice to be able to find it, know your relative location and get a sense like if that's gonna be a problem. If you needed to kind of plan, I'm starting in the Northeast because that's where I'm from. If you were needing to kind of plan a evacuation route and especially anywhere on the East Coast, the big Achilles heel of the East Coast is nuclear power plants. We've got so many of them. You got hardly any of them out across the rest of the country uh, to you guys' benefit, everybody living out over there. And I, I, I guess this is, this is one of the things if you're conservative, you're supposed to think that nuclear power is great. I think that's like if you're on Team Conservative, that's one of the beliefs that you're supposed to have. Like if you're a liberal, you have to uh, definitely be down with any vaccines that the government mandates uh, or, or suggests that you should have, whether they've been tested or not. If you're a conservative, you have to be down with nuclear power plants. I think that's one of the rules <laughs> for, for those teams. Um, but yeah, I, I'm joking because I, I don't prescribe any of that like label kind of stuff. You know, to, you know, pick your beliefs based on your own values, not on whatever your, your, your team tells you you're supposed to believe. But um, I used to live near a nuclear power plant, uh, and it's being shut down now, thankfully. But um, I never had any problems with nuclear power uh, as an idea prior to moving next to one. I just kind of figured, um, you know, I, you know, it's got its pros and its cons, but so does burning coal. So uh, not a lot of pros and cons for solar. I happen to like solar, but you know, I mean, it's got its cons too. I mean, eventually the solar panels get, uh, you know, you got to get rid of them, and they, they're landfill material, though, you know. Every other kind of power plant becomes a landfill material at some point also. So I don't know, anyway, they all get their pros and their cons. Um, but moving next to a, a nuclear power plant, I think one of the big issues with nuclear power plants that will never, ever be resolved is that every nuclear power plant is always going to be run by human beings. And that is the end of the story as far as I need to know in terms of whether you can trust that everything's always going to go well at those situations. 
Whenever you put humans into the mix, they're always, they always eventually cut corners. Even if the, the initial team that you set up is like, you know, a crack team and they're not going to make any mistakes, eventually they're going to get replaced with other people and the standards are going to slip and they're going to need to, you know, keep things within a budget and they're going to cut corners somewhere. And it's just always a way with whenever humans do anything. Now, if you do that at a coal fire plant, and you know something goes wrong you know yeah it's not going to be a great situation but if if you have issues like that at a nuclear power plant the ramifications of something going wrong in a nuclear power plant are just so severe and we've seen them multiple times throughout our history and as soon as there's an event people are all like skittish around nuclear power and then like a couple of years or a decade goes by and then people like forget about all that and then they're all like oh maybe nuclear power is actually kind of an interesting idea um Living next to one, I'm just going to give uh, really one anecdote uh, from, from this one. Eh, I'll throw another one at the end too. Um, I read in the, in the paper uh, just some random day that uh, it was like a couple of weeks ago. This had already gone by and this was like my big concern is that like it wouldn't be an emergency that you'd hear about. It'd be something would happen, they'd keep it hush hush and then you'd find out later that there had been a release because new, you know, radiation or uh, radioactive particles are, you know, tasteless, color, colorless, you know, that kind of stuff. As much as they can keep it secret, they're going to try to keep it secret. Usually, that's what humans tend to do. So, uh, you know, I, I read in the local paper that there had been an issue where there was not a release of anything, although there was a release, and they, they presently are actually leaking into the Connecticut River. Quite, quite, a, quite a bit of radioactive water uh, on a daily basis, but this is a separate issue. The issue that had come up was that the backup cooling system, now the backup cooling system is the cooling system that is supposed to engage if the primary cooling system goes down. If something happens with the primary cooling system, you need to have that backup ready to go to prevent meltdown. The backup cooling system collapsed due to the pipes all rusting out. I wonder how many inspections do you have to I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't want to say this is an accusation or a libel because I don't know, but how many inspections have to happen at that facility and people turn a blind eye for piping to literally rust out to the point where it collapses of its own accord? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I don't know what was going wrong. I don't know whether it was an issue with inspectors. I don't know if it was an issue with the rules. I don't know if it was an issue with people uh, lying to inspectors. I don't know what the issue was. I just know that the end result of whatever their issues were was that the, the main system that it was there as a failsafe against that nuclear power plant going into uh, meltdown, if the primary cooling system went down, the backup was gone. The backup would not have worked if something had happened to the primary system. The only other fallback they have is actually to flood the place with the river that it was uh, uh, built next to. Uh, you know, so that and so many other issues, I, I, I know uh, nuclear power plants have regulations about how warm the water in the river has to be for them to operate in order to be able to cool effectively, but with rising global temperatures, I know a lot of nuclear power plants have actually changed what they consider to be the safe maximum level of water temperature in order to do their cooling. Humans are always trying to cut corners. If you have a solar power facility and humans cut corners, maybe it creates a blackout. For a coal fire plant, maybe you have a fire. For a nuclear power plant, the ramifications of human error and human greed and human negligence and all the other human problems is so severe, I'm not... I severely dislike the idea of nuclear power because humans are always going to be in the equation. In a perfect world, run by perfect beings, which we are not, maybe nuclear power could be great. I mean, in theory, it's great. It's a great way to get energy. That said, uranium-235, there's only so much of that that you can uh, mine, you can reprocess that later, and I guess it becomes more and more uh, dangerous, but in smaller and smaller quantities, so there's something to be said for that. You know, there are solutions there, but as long as humans are involved in the party, it's always going to be problematic. And the East Coast is just a minefield of radiation waiting to be released if there was an EMP attack, if there was any kind of a major natural disaster, some kind of major outage, some kind of a war. That is our major Achilles heel over on the East Coast. We don't have earthquakes, really. We don't have, um, uh, you know, tidal waves from, you know, again, from earthquakes. Uh, you know, wildfires aren't really a big thing up here, but nuclear power, man, 
that is an issue. Anyway, I'm bringing this map with me because on our way back, you know, I'm always ready for there to be an EMP, and which would maybe make this car not work, but I want it. I always like the idea that worst comes to worst, I could walk back. And I know that's kind of a romantic notion, but it'd be nice to have a map to, to find my way back. So that's why I got a paper map. And you should always have a paper map uh, wherever you go. They're getting harder to get. Uh, I was trying to get myself a paper map uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I was just going to order on Amazon or something. And they're on way back order. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, it was like, it'd be like a month and a half before you could get your paper map. And um, I was thinking, well, geez, I thought ordering a month ahead for my map so, I, so that I don't have to pull my other maps out of the fallout shelter. Um, I thought that'd be sufficient. So, um, so I was thinking, well, you know, I'll, just, I'll go by like a convenience store or like a Walmart or, um, or a gas station. The gas stations always had maps. Um, I went to all of those and none of them were carrying maps anymore. So I, I don't know, I guess people just don't use paper maps anymore because everybody's got, you know, on their phones and their GPS and they figure your phone will never go down, the GPS will never go down, so why? It'd be crazy to have a map if, you know, GPS is always going to work, um, if. So um, I think there's just not a lot of uh, demand for maps anymore. You know, that's one of the things with, like, uh, with baby boomers. Uh, you know, once the baby boomers are gone, a lot of this kind of stuff, I think, might go with them. It, you know, just the, the market for um, uh, selling this kind of stuff might kind of dry up. So the, the time to get things like this, I think, is... Uh, is diminishing because um, you know the boomers are there there are aspects of boomer life that are positive in my opinion and negative in my opinion but one of the positive things I think is you know, a lot of them you know jumped onto the iPhones and all that but they still kind of like having the paper map back up because that's how they grew up and you know paper money that's how they grew up um, and uh, you know once that generation is gone I think <laughs> A lot of the, the, the tethers to this kind of stuff, this and paper money and stuff, are going to be released and um, we're going to get unshackled as a society to just go s stampeding off in directions that, uh, I don't know, I don't know if they'll be good ideas, but uh, get paper maps while you can. I don't think they're going to be like completely diff uh, you know, impossible to get, but uh, I don't know, I, I was having trouble getting one last minute. So I'm going to put this back in there, I'm going to go in, make a little bit more list, still going to pack clothes. Still gonna pack some extra uh, food. I don't like eating out of the emergency food bag. It's not, it's not fun stuff. It's compact, dense calories in there. That's it, this is a long video. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you are gonna go and check out the Eclipse, good luck with your individual uh, attempts at that. It's gonna be challenging all over the country. It looks like Mexico and maybe Southwestern Texas are the only places that have particularly good shots. Um, let me know how you do down in the comments below. And uh, thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, if you enjoyed this video, here's another that I think you might like. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people you see on the right hand side of your screen. They help to support all the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and get your name added to the list, the link's below.